All right. Hotep, everybody. Hey, this is Michael M. Hotep, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecture writer, and historian. It is Saturday, August 13th, 2022, and we are live. Uh, I'm teaching another session of my online uh, history class today uh, around 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa understanding the transatlantic slave trade where they didn't teach you in school uh this is normally a 10-week online history class that i teach i talked about it some on roller martin unfiltered on friday august 12th uh we're teaching another session today this time around it's going to be 12 weeks uh when we teach it and uh you can register for this online class we have the information here in the thread of the broadcast you can join us at our online school i'll be teaching the class around 2 p.m eastern standard time today and i do a powerpoint presentation we have book references articles video clips here's a uh i want so i want to do a brief preview today of some of the information we cover in this class we deal with, deal with thousands of years of history and what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place so we can't start studying our history in slavery even when we study the transatlantic slave trade, which is important to study, we can't start in 1619 uh, with uh, those 29 Africans in Virginia. We can't start in the 1440s with the Portuguese getting involved in the transatlantic slave trade with uh, Anton Gonzalez in uh, 1441 going into uh, present day uh, Mauritania. We have to deal with thousands of years of history and what leads up to uh the transatlantic slave trade taking place and we have to also deal with the 800 year occupation of uh europe by the africans known as the moors who take the teachings from ancient kemet ancient egypt into europe and these teachings are going to bring europe out of the dark ages okay so uh one of the things we deal with in class and we'll talk about some in today's class um, when, the, when those Africans known as the Moors go into the Iberian Peninsula today known as Spain and Portugal in 711 AD, and they're going to various extents Africanize Europe, Africanize Europe. And this is going to, uh, we see the Moors lose control in uh, Europe, especially in Spain. And uh, the, the last known stronghold was uh, uh, relinquished in uh, January 2nd, 1492. And then we're going to see the relationship between the transatlantic slave trade and the Moors losing control in Europe as well. So this course not only deals with the transatlantic slave trade, but it also deals with thousands of years of history that leads up to the transatlantic slave trade uh, of African people taking place. August 20th, 2019 marked the 400th year anniversary of those 29 Africans who, ca who came into Point Comfort in Virginia, August 20th, 1619, on the White Lion pirate ship, the White Lion pirate ship in what would later be called the uh, colony of Virginia. Okay, so um, it's important to also understand that African people have been in the land we call the United States of America going back at least 51,700 years. So even though we talk about uh, 1619, and then uh, also in the class, we, we also deal with 1526, because uh, 1526, you have the Spanish taking Africans into uh, the territory that, to territory that we call uh, South Carolina and Georgia, okay? That's in 1526. This is 93 years before, um, this is 93 years before uh, Virginia and those 29 Africans in Virginia. So one of the problems with the way this history is taught is that uh, it, a lot of times our history is taught starting with African people conquered and shackled and changed by Europeans. And that's problematic. And that's also traumatizing to uh, African-American children and those African-American children grew up to be adults. So if you, if your understanding of the beginning of African people in this country starts with us conquered by Europeans shackled in chains. Okay. You're going to, you're going to probably deal with some self-esteem issues. You're probably going to have a distorted uh, view of history. Okay. Because this was our land stolen from us. African people were in this land that we call the United States of America going back at least 51,700 years. Okay. So I'm just doing a brief overview of this class. And uh, we're just looking at some of the things that we cover uh, in in, uh, in this course. I'm teaching another session of this class today, 
2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time at our online school. We have the information here in the thread of the broadcast. You can register for the class. It's on sale, $60. Uh, we do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. You can go back and watch it anytime or visit our new website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. All right, so this is uh, Dr. David M. Hotep who wrote the book, The First Americans Were Africans, Documented Evidence. And his book uh, has 713 footnotes and it deals with thousands of years of history. And uh, page 14 of his book, uh, it deals with a discovery made in 2004 in Allendale County, South Carolina, by Dr. Albert Goodyear. And he uh, discovered 13 uh, different types of evidence that fairly document an African presence in this country going back at least 51,700 years ago. These were the Khoisan, who have the oldest DNA DNA on the planet. They come from Southern Africa. They're the ancestors to the Ainu and the Twa. So they found uh, artifacts, architecture, campsites, carvings, footprints, and lava, genetic M174D haploid groups dealing with DNA and genetics. Uh, they found uh, Egyptian uh, carvings, Egyptian writings, footprints, and lava, uh, linguistics, paintings, skulls, skeleton structures, and tools, 13 different types of evidence fairly documenting an African presence in this country going back at least 51,700 years ago. This is an article from uh, ScienceDaily.com dealing with Dr. Albert Goodyear in the discovery that he made. Um, this article is from November 18, 2004. New evidence puts man in North America 50,000 years ago. New evidence puts man in North America 50,000 years ago. Uh, here's a summary of the article from ScienceDaily.com. This is ScienceDaily.com summary. Radiocarbon tests of carbonized plant remains where artifacts were unearthed last May along the Savannah River uh, in Allendale County uh, by University of South Carolina archaeologist Dr. Albert Goodyear indicate that the sediments containing these artifacts are at least 50,000 years old. Indicate that the sediments um, uh, containing these artifacts are at least 50,000 years old, meaning that humans inhabited North America long before the last ice age, okay? So they're talking about these humans that they're talking about or the Khoisan um, who have the oldest DNA on the planet. They go all around the world and they were here in the land that we call the United States of America as well. Now, this is before the transatlantic slave trade happens. Yet I'm not saying the transatlantic slave trade did not happen. What I'm saying is we have to understand thousands of years of history before the transatlantic slave trade happened. And unfortunately, a lot of times in the classes that we take in college, a lot of times in these conversations that we have, even during African-American History Month, oftentimes we start the history of African people in this country conquering and shackled and changed by Europeans. And that's psychologically damaging okay, to, to our people. So. Um, this piece right here on the Khoisan cites the information from Science Magazine, an October 2012 genetic study published in Science Magazine found that the, that the Khoisan in Southern Africa are the oldest ethnic group of modern humans, the oldest ethnic group of modern humans with their ancestral line originating about 100,000 years ago. The Khoisan, formerly called by the derogatory term Bushmen, are genetically unique and no other currently known population had separated so early from our common modern human ancestor according to uh the report now here um is a, a picture of uh two khoisan women okay these are the short statute africans the khoisan who are the ancestors to thy new and the twa the khoisan live mainly in southern africa in territory spanning botswana namibia angola Zambia, Zimbabwe, and South Africa. They are largely divided into two groups, hunters and gatherers, known as the Sans people, and keepers of livestock, known as the Khoi Khoi people. The Khoisan languages include the distinctive click sounds that are not found in languages of their neighbors. Okay, there's a good article that uh, uh, from AtlantaBlackStar.com, five ethnic groups that prove the first humans were black. OK, so and when we talk about the click language, the click language is the oldest language. And we know that uh, when you look at the film Black Panther, the language spoken in the film Black Panther is Isi Kosa, which is a Bantu language spoken in southern Africa. And Isi Kosa has the click sounds in it also. OK, 
So in, in, as we talk about the film Black Panther, I did a lot of the three months of research to be able to do my lectures on that film. And the film Black Panther relates to African history, African culture, African language, spiritual systems, etc. We look at a number of different archaeological studies uh, and discoveries in this course also. OK, to deal with thousands of years of history leading up to the transatlantic slave trade. Then we go through and uh, we analyze the transatlantic slave trade. This was a significant discovery here in uh, 2010. There was an article from The New York Times that dealt with this called On Crete, New Evidence of Very Ancient Mariners. On Crete, New Evidence of Very Ancient Mariners. And it, de it deals with uh, this discovery uh, made on the Greek island of Crete. And they did excavations for two, over the course of two summers, okay? And they found uh, stone tools uh, dating back at least 130,000 years old, 130,000 years ago, okay? Uh, stone tools found on the Greek island of Crete, uh, archaeologists say are at least 130,000 years old, which is considered strong evidence for the earliest known seafaring in the Mediterranean and calls for rethinking the maritime capabilities of pre-human cultures. Okay, so one of the things that you're going to, one of the themes of the class, one of the things you're going to find out when we look at these archaeological discoveries is that they keep pushing the timelines back. Uh, when these new discoveries come out, this is causing the archaeologists, the paleontologists, the researchers, et cetera, to rethink this history and push the timelines back. And they're realizing that all of this stuff is much older than they thought. OK, so the deeper they dig, the blacker the planet gets, the more research they do, the older we get. Uh, so they found stone tools that they that 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 they say are at least one hundred and thirty thousand years old, which is considered strong evidence of the. Uh, earliest known seafaring in the Mediterranean and calls for rethinking the maritime capabilities of pre-human cultures. Now, Crete has been an island for more than 5 million years. Crete has been an island for more than 5 million years, meaning that the tool makers must have arrived by boat. So this seems to push the history of Mediterranean voyaging back more than 100,000 years, specialists in Stone Age archaeology say. Previously, uh, previous artifact discoveries, previous artifact discoveries, um, put uh, seems uh, previous artifact discoveries uh, thought that seafaring in the Mediterranean uh, islands like Cyprus and a few other Greek islands, possibly, possibly Sardinia, uh, were no earlier than ten thousand to twelve thousand years ago. Okay. But this discovery here seems to push the history of Mediterranean voyaging back more than 100,000 years. So once again, the deeper they dig, the blacker the planet gets, the more research they do, the older we get. OK, so, re, uh, so check out that article. We talk about the lost city of Egypt, Thomas Heraklion, that uh, uh, sunk into the bottom of the sea. And it was it was uh, a discovery in um, 2013 of what this expedition team found, uh, led by archaeologist Frank Gardillo. So the the, 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 uh, the name of the city was called Tanis Heraklion, Tanis Heraklion. And this was called the Lost City of Egypt. And um, they found uh, the, the, the UK publication, The Telegraph, has some good information on this. And there's some other uh, news outlets that reported on this. Actually, all the news outlets had information on this. But uh, the Telegraph reports that 150 uh, feet beneath the surface of Egypt's Bay of Abu Kir, they found 64 ships, 16 foot tall statues, 700 acres, uh, anchors, uh, countless gold coins and similar artifacts, countless gold coins and similar artifacts. Now, uh, archaeologist Frank Gadillo, who led this ex excavation, uh, he estimates that Tanis Heraklion was built around 8th century BC, okay, built around 8th century BC or BCE. Now, these are some of the uh, artifacts and statues, things like that they found at the bottom uh, of the sea, okay? This is straight out of ancient Kim in ancient Egypt. All right, so um, th then you had uh, another lost city of Egypt, 
um, that was that that was discovered um, in 2021. This news came out April 2021 inside the lost city of Egypt. NBC News, uh, the Today Show, had a big story on this, and um, this 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 city was called Dazzling Aten, uh, named after uh, Akhenaten, Dazzling Aten, and uh, this uh, this this is a 3,000 year old. Uh, lost city as well. So these archaeological this, this um, city dates back to about three thousand four hundred years ago. Okay, and these archaeological discoveries are coming out every other week. Okay, these archaeological discoveries are coming out every other week, and when they come out, they they're causing um, the scientists, etc., to rethink everything. Okay. And as I as, as I've said before, you know, the deeper they dig, the blacker the planet gets, the more research they do, the older we get. So it's important to understand this chronology of history that leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. Um, we know that this land was called also Egypt of the West, especially by the founding fathers. And when you look at Freemasonry, we know that Freemasonry deals with the teachings that the Moors took the African Moors. Uh, uh, were the custodians of, and this, these, these teachings came from the Nile Valley region of, of Africa, and the Moors take this information into Europe and teach this, teach this they teach this to Europeans, okay? And it's going to be this information that brings Europe out of the Dark Ages. And we see uh, symbols of Africa all around us, one of those prominent symbols of Africa coming from the mythology of the story of Asar or Set and Heru is the Washington Monument, or what is in ancient times was called a Tekken, which is a symbol of, of resurrection coming from ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt, okay? The Washington Monument is a Tekken, and we know that uh, many of the founding fathers of this country were Freemasons, and Freemasonry is, uh, the foundation of Freemasonry is the uh, teachings coming out of ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt, or what, what are called the mystery systems or the mystery school. So, there was a good article from face to face africa.com that deals with uh, Cleopatra's needle, how three ancient Egyptian obelisks, what the Greeks call obelisks, ended up in New York City, London, and Paris, France. Okay. And these are uh, now there were about 1200 Tekkenu in ancient times. Today they're less than 12. And some of them have been taken to uh, Istanbul, Turkey, and taken to London, France, and uh, taken to Italy, et cetera. Some are recreations. Uh, these three right here on the left, you see uh, the Tekkenu in London, uh, the Tekken in London. Uh, the center is the Tekken in New York City, and on the right, the Tekken in Paris, France. Ancient Egyptians or the ancient Kemetic people called obelisks Tekkenu. You'll see different spellings for Tekkenu for plural. You'll see different spellings of it. Uh, and they were also used to tell the time in the past. Their pinnacles were basically covered in gold uh, to reflect the sunlight. Historians say the obelisks represented immortality and eternity, and their long structure helped connect the heavens and the earth. Their long structure helped connect the heavens and the earth. Currently, Cleopatra's Needle is the name given to the three ancient Egyptian obelisks, obelisks one in New York City, one in London, and one in Paris, France. However, they do not all come from one Egyptian site, okay? Um, they do not all come from one Egyptian site. The obelisks in New York and London are carved out of um, red granite from the quarries of Aswan, uh, a major source of stone for Egyptian antiquities. The two obelisks were commissioned by Pharaoh Thutmose III or Nesubiti Thutmose III for the Temple of the Sun in Heliopolis near modern day Cairo, with uh, each weighing about 224 tons and 64 feet tall. Uh, so check out this article from face to face Africa dot com for May 17th, 2022. That gives more insight into that. So this is a famous uh, statue of the uh, Asar, Aset and Heru, who the Greeks called Osiris, Isis and Horus. And we know when we read Egypt on the on the Potomac by Tony Browder, who's a brilliant archaeologist and a friend of mine. I've interviewed him a number of times. 
Um, there were approximately 1,200 Tekkenu built in Kemet in ancient times, but only about a dozen are found in Egypt today. Uh, many of the Tekkenu removed from Egypt are now in Istanbul, Turkey, London, England, Paris, France, Berlin, Germany, New York, New York, Rome, Italy, the Vatican City, and elsewhere throughout the world. The Tekkenu are now called obelisks by their new owners, and few know their origin or that they symbolize the resurrection of the African king Asar. Okay, so read Egypt on the Potomac by page 17. So these are just some of the, this is just some of the few things, because there's over 200 slides in the class. Just a, a few of the, the things that we deal with in this 10 week, uh, this time around, it's going to be 12 weeks. Online history class that I teach, ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. You know, the panther deity that we see in the film, Black Panther, Bast, comes from Bastet, which comes out of ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt. And this was a, uh, a goddess deity, a netter uh, in the form of a lioness and later a cat who was a netter of warfare in, in lower Kemet. Uh, the film Black Panther relates to African history, culture, language, spiritual systems. In the Black Panther comic book, we know that the uh, the um, the deities um, are referred to as the or Orisha, the Orisha, which is the uh, Yoruba term for the deities in the spiritual system of Ifa practiced amongst the Yoruba in Nigeria. And the Orisha's origin dates back to the ancient Egyptian beings known as the Ennead. And uh, you'll see names like uh, for some of these deities in, in Wakanda, Koku, Thoth, Bast, Mujaji, Pata, Niyami. OK, some of those come straight out of ancient uh, Kemet as well. The Ennead referred to uh, means group of nine in Greek. And in ancient Kemet, they were called Pesjet. The, uh, the, the Ennead referred to the nine Netaru, uh, uh, Atom, which means sun, Shu, air, tough net, uh, Tefnut, moisture, Geb was uh, referred to the earth, Nut, sky, Asar, uh, Aset, Seth, and Nephetus. Okay, so these were the, uh, th this comes straight out of ancient Kemet as well, but we see this represented in the Black Panther comic book also. We know that Isikosa, which is the language spoken in the film Black Panther, is a Bantu language as well. Bantu is a group of five or some 500 African languages belonging to the Bantuid subgroup of the Banu uh, Congo branch of the Niger Congo language family. The Bantu languages are spoken in a very large area, including most of Africa from southern Cameroon, uh, eastward to, to Kenya, southward to the southernmost tip of the continent, including South Africa. OK, and we know that uh, Amazulu or Zulu is a Bantu language as well as Kiswahili. So Kwanzaa is a Kiswahili word. That's, that's a that's a Bantu language. Also Kiswahili um, as well. So in we also in this class, of course, you know, we deal with some African civilizations uh, as well, like uh, Carthage and uh, Axum. Uh, things like this. We talk about Hannibal Barca and the Punic Wars and Publius Cornelius Scipio Africanus and why Africa is not named after Publius Cornelius Scipio Africanus. Uh, we talk about the Kingdom of Great Zimbabwe as well. Uh, and then we deal with uh, some of the history of the Moors uh, also and the Moors conquering the Vandals and the Visigoths and Tariq Ibn Ziyad going into uh, leading an army into the Iberian Peninsula, today known as Spain and Portugal, um, in, in 711 AD and conquering, and they conquered the Vandals and the Visigoths. They're going to settle in the, in the southern portion of what becomes known as France, and they're going to Africanize the various, various extents of uh, Europe. They're going to create libraries. They uh, are voluminous writers. Uh, some of the uh, early universities uh, in um uh, in Europe are created to study the Moor science texts, to study the teachings that the Moors take into Europe, like the University of Salamanca in Spain and, and uh, Toledo and um, um, the, the, uh, Naples, different universities that they have there. Uh, they're going to be created to study the Moor science texts. Um, so we talk about the uh, three great West African kingdoms, also Ghana, Songhai, and Mali. Uh, and we look at this history chronologically also, okay? So there's a timeline of history that we look at. 
so this is just a brief overview of this class. We talk about people like Mansa Musa and show the relationship between Mansa Musa as well as T'Challa and Black Panther, because T'Challa was probably the richest person in the in the Marvel uh, comic universe. Uh, Mansa Musa becomes emperor of the Mali Empire, 1312 A.D., uh, when the II the goes missing on the expedition. Uh, and then we have to look at Christopher, Christopher Columbus, Cristobal Cologne, and where Columbus went on his four voyages, what he was looking for, the deal that he made with uh, King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella. And it's important to understand that Columbus never came to the land that we call the United States of America. Columbus never came to the land we call the United States of America. The closest he came here was Cuba, which is 90 miles away. This is just a brief overview of the class. I've got to get out of here and teach this class now because it starts, uh, we're going to start about 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, um, Saturday, August 13th. So you join us at our online school. The class is on sale, $60, regular $130. The best value is the uh, bundle pack. Uh, you get uh, both classes, my Saturday class, as well as the Sunday class. You get both classes for $100. Uh, so if you visit our website, our new website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. Scroll down the page. You'll see the picture of me and information about my radio show. We have our Cash App information and PayPal. If you want to pay for the class through Cash App, you can send the money through Cash App also. Here's our Cash App tag, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App. Click here to register for both classes, uh, has registered here. You can pay debit card or credit card, follow the prompts. It, it gives you the option to use PayPal. And then below that, it gives you the option for debit card, credit card. You don't have to have a PayPal account. So this class here, um, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, what they didn't teach you in school. That's regularly $130 on sale, $60. We do the class live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. You can go back and watch it anytime. And then on Sundays, I teach from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968, okay? In this class, we start in 1803 with the Louisiana Purchase, and then we look at the Louisiana Purchase and the Haitian Revolution because those two uh, events are related. And then we uh, go through history chronologically. We look at the Civil War and what leads to the Civil War taking place. Civil War... Reconstruction, 1865 to 1877, uh, Jim Crow era, World War One, World War II, Civil Rights Movement, Black Power Movement, Great Migration. To understand what happened to us after slavery ended, what were the laws and policies put in place uh, to uh, put us in a predicament we're in today to understand where we need to go from here. OK, and African history and culture gives us our foundation. It gives us our values, our interests and our principles. And this influences our economic empowerment and political empowerment. OK, so this these history classes will change the way that you look at history. We have the link here in the thread of the broadcast is also on our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Best value is the bundle pack. Uh, so it gets you bo both classes for a hundred dollars. That's over a uh, $360 value because this bonus content that you'll get from me also in the class. You can, uh, watch these classes live or on demand. Once you register for the class, even a year from now, two years from now, you'll still have access to the full course. I would say the information is PG 13. You can use this with our youth as well. Uh, so it's, I don't, I don't do a lot of cursing. It's not overly graphic, etc. Class is very visual. There's tons of articles that we cite also, so you can check that out. If you have any questions, you can also email me at uh, uh, through the website or at ahnshowtheafricanhistorynetwork.com, our new web, uh, new email address, uh, ahnshow at theafricanhistorynetwork.com, okay? So we look to see you in class Saturday and Sunday. And uh, Sundays, I teach from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement of Black Power, 1865 to 1968. Look, I have to get out of here. I have to teach this class now. You can join us in class. You can register and join us in class right now. Right now, it's correct. Wrong behavior is not over till we win. We're kind of forever. We'll talk to you.